Howdy. Welcome to episode three this year of, it is the third one, yeah, Feb 2nd. Uh, we just had the inauguration of President Obama. And that was kind of a media circus. Uh, but more importantly, uh, in the news, the Portland Christmas tree bomber has just been convicted. Now, he's definitely a patsy. As his father said, he uh, was brainwashed by the FBI. Uh, it, it's clearly a case where, you know, he's not innocent. He, he's screwed up in the head. Whether you could say he's criminally responsible or not, I don't know. I, he, he, he has mental problems. But it's clear that there would have been no issue at all without the FBI. There would have been no terrorist plot. There would have been no bomb plot. There would have been no entrapment. Nothing. So the problem is the FBI running rampant again. Um, check your TV guide. I've just submitted two videos. One is on Operation Gladio, which describes the CIA's uh, Operation Gladio in Europe uh, from the 40s, I think it was from the middle 40s up through the 80s, the CIA conducted bomb uh, attacks and assassinations and uh, on, on a scale unheard of. That's why we say it's not unreasonable to suspect our own government because we are criminally, criminally uh, misbehaving all over the world. Um, we've got a roll-in coming up here. I think I'll, we'll go ahead and go to that right away. It's uh, the war on terror making us less safe. Are, are we ready to go, folks? Well, let's just put it this way. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of things today, so get ready to call in. We're going to be talking about the Second Amendment. Uh, it's just incredible that anybody is buying the idea that, you know, somehow the Second Amendment is about duck hunting. And they downplay, in fact, they, they criticize anybody as a nutcase if you quote the Constitution and then uh, explain the underlying purposes of the Second Amendment. The purpose is to prevent a rogue government from becoming totalitarian. If the people are armed, the government is not as likely to, you know, oppress the people. When the government is armed and the people are not, the people live in tyranny. And that's throughout history. You know, you can say, well, I don't need a assault rifle. Every adult male and female in this country should have a military style weapon, fully automatic, it, it, you know, the, the works in their, you know, standing in their closet like the Swiss do. And though, you know, that's the militia. We are the militia. The militia they're talking about in the Second Amendment is we the people. Okay, so we're ready to go with that clip that I was talking about. And uh, just go ahead and roll it. I'll be back in about nine, ten minutes. Liberties have been repealed. However, every time this has happened, it's been temporary in times of war or strife. And the rights have always been reinstated to the public. Take, for example, in 1861 when Lincoln temporarily suspended habeas corpus until the following year. What about under the Sedition Act of 1917, where anti-war speech against World War I was criminalized, only to be repealed three years later? Or many of you probably remember learning about Executive Order 9066, when FDR authorized the internment of Japanese American citizens for four horrifying years. And lastly, during the Red Scare, McCarthy's witch hunt against Americans who were suspected to be communists lasted six years. 
And in all of these cases, as an unconstitutional as they were, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. But fast forward to today. For the first time in American history, the rights of citizens have been systematically eroded under a blanket war against terror that has no clear goals, enemy, or end. So what does this mean for the restoration of our civil liberties today? To talk about just this, I was joined earlier by independent journalist Robbie Martin of MediaRoots.org. Check it out. So Robbie, how is this war different than all these other periods in history that I just went over? Um, well, it's different in the fact that duration, which you went over quite well in your intro, but also it's different because all this was brought into fruition from 9-11, which is now over a decade old, and we haven't had any sort of ongoing threat or crisis that would um, legitimize these continuing civil liberty curtailments. Uh, so it's different in the sense that, you know, the things you mentioned, like the Civil War and World War II and the McCarthy era, I mean, each one of those actually had a cohesive, you know, you could argue about the reasoning for the for the civil liberties erosions that happened during those events, you know, that's a whole different argument. But they were all real things. The Civil War was a, was a crisis, an American crisis. Um, World War II um, was an actual military, you know, operation. Um, we interned the Japanese because we thought that they were spies, which is absurd, but that's, that was the reason. Um, so it's, it's very different in the sense that this has almost turned into background noise, mm. um, where there's actually not anything happening or legitimizing these continuing erosions. Right, and they, and they keep happening, Robbie. I mean, and, and as you just said, there's nothing to legitimize them. I mean, the threat of terrorism is virtually non-existent in this country. You're more likely to die from accidental suffocation in bed than you are of a terrorist attack. And I wanted to play this clip from Glenn Greenwald on the Sam Cedars show talking about the Patriot Act. And now the Patriot Act is just something that never gets discussed anymore. It's not considered controversial. It's just blended in to our political um, culture. It's just something we now take for granted. And this to me shows how what is at one time a radical act um, and viewed as extremism um, ultimately becomes just normalized by lasting long enough and then just sort of blending into the woodwork. Let's, uh... I love what he says there because it's so true, Robbie. I mean, the Patriot Act was just one in a long list of systematic erosions of our civil liberties that, that isn't uh, talked about at all. It's just reinstated every time. There's absolutely no point of contention when at the time it was actually extremely controversial, so much uh, dissent against it, and now it's just voted in. I don't know. I mean, what do yeah. you think about it? Um, well, the Patriot Act is... Is, is one, I would say, one of three things that we, that we did after 9-11 and, you know, supposedly in response to it. Um, and, the, you know, the, the provisions in it which, which basically make sneak and peek searches legal for any suspected terrorist or whatever, um, you know, which essentially means the government could come into your house, search your entire house, your computer, take all your data and never tell you and never have to bring it up in the court of law if they actually do prosecute you. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's really, it's disturbing and unsettling how much it's gone into the background, that the Patriot Act has already been in existence for 10 years. It was signed again by Obama, um, where he added on an extension to it. So, I mean, as far as I can see, uh, there's no chance that it will actually be repealed anytime soon, and it's already gone on for over 10 years. Right, right. So and and let's let's talk really quickly about what this is doing to people, especially like you said. I mean, these sneak and peek searches, the Patriot Act's opening this this massive surveillance grid, allowing for warrantless wiretapping. How does the surveillance grid and all of these new technologies play a role into the stifling of dissent, the chilling effect in this culture of fear in a post 9/11 world? Well. You know, if it wasn't irreversible enough by the duration and, and sort of the non-event that this was done in its response to, um, it makes it even more irreversible because technology has become so advanced in the last decade. Um, you know, 9-11 happened around the same time that the Internet was breaking through to the mainstream. So the Internet, 
Um, GPS tracking being affordable, you know, you can get a GPS tracker for 25, 40 bucks now. Um, and, you know, I mean, imagine what law enforcement and government have so much power now to spy on everybody and database communications from every everything um, that it makes it it makes it more permanent. That's a I mean, really, really good point right there is that it's almost impossible to go back. I mean, look at the even the surveillance apparatus is now um, crossed over with the corporate corporatocracy. I mean, the military industrial complex, all of these corporations and, and military corporations that are profiting off this technology, off of these erosions of our rights, the surveillance. Let's talk about habeas corpus, though, because I think a lot of instances in the past when habeas corpus was repealed temporarily, I mean, it was a huge deal temporarily was repealed and then reinstated now i mean we look back at the internment of japanese citizens it's almost embarrassing it, it's it is embarrassing i mean it's horrifying that we did that and now you know you have the ndaa passed reinstated even after this lawsuit massive protests i mean why is this accepted well it's accepted for basically the what we're talking about now is the reason that it's accepted everybody's been conditioned to accept this sort of background noise of privacy, you know, elimination with the Patriot Act. Um, Gitmo has existed for over 10 years, so you can make, you draw a comparison to that, to the internment camps, and the internment camps were only around for four years. It took 35 years for the U.S. government to acknowledge the kind of the, um, you know, the violation that that was. Uh, Jimmy Carter paid out $200,000 to all the surviving people, uh, the Japanese who were interned. Um, it's already been 10 years of Gitmo. We're still accusing them of being dangerous terrorists, but yet where there's never been, you know, there's been very few trials of any of these people. Um, they're there indefinitely. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't see us looking back on this with the same level of embarrassment because it's become normalized. It's not like those other events in history where they were done in response to a, a major crisis that was ongoing. This you're, is not ongoing. You're when right. 9 11 happened on one single day. Right, Robbie. We've given the government a complete blank check in a post 9 11 world. It's absolutely unacceptable. Um, we need to demand our rights back before it's too late. Thank you so much for coming on, giving us your take. Robbie Martin of MediaRoots.org. Thanks for having me, Abby. <laughs> we explain this world to our children. Looking up the next video there, um, we've got a real crisis. People are being dumbed down. We're being uh, desensitized. They're having military uh, urban warfare drills involving our military. And how about Polish troops? Yeah, they're bringing in troops from all over the world because they won't hesitate to shoot Americans. On that same note, uh, in the news, over a thousand Green Berets have signed on to a, a, a they, they've all taken an oath and signed the pledge that they will not participate in an uh, unconstitutional gun grab. Uh, this morning, the, uh, let's see, I think it was the American Sheriff's Association. I might, I might have that wrong, but it's one of the sheriff's associations that uh, uh, has membership all across the states. Uh, have, they have come out saying that they will not participate in enforcing any gun grab or illegal, con you know, unconstitutional. Let's put it this way. Anything the Congress does about the Second Amendment without holding a constitutional convention where they vote you know, two thirds of the people, whatever, whatever the procedure is to change the constitution. If they don't change the constitution and just try to make laws that kind of circumvent it, those laws are null and void. Uh, unfortunately, we usually have to wait until they're adjudicated, and the Supreme Court is a political organization that isn't doing its job as far as enforcing uh, the constitution. Um, well, I've got another video here. Now, this is the other one of the two videos that I said I just uh, submitted for uh, broadcast here at Portland Community Media. This video is um, 
about a, a, a CIA whistleblower who, instead of being, you know, applauded for blowing the whistle on government corruption, um, he was prosecuted and and convicted under an 1800s Anti-Sedition Act. It's one of the most undemocratic, un let's just put it this way, totalitarian. We are well on the way to being the, the country that we used to complain bitterly that, you know, why didn't the German people do anything to stop it as Hitler rose to power? Well, why didn't the Americans do anything to stop it? Well, we took over the world and slaughtered people wholesale all over the world. Drones are, you know, remote control killing. They're planning on building robot armies so they don't need to have people who would have, you know, moral convictions that would have to be overcome to obey certain unreasonable, unlawful orders. Well, if you're ready in there, let's go ahead and roll that. Anderson, a 27-year veteran of the FBI who retired uh, in March of 1979. At the time of my retirement, I was the senior special agent in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division with more than 700 personnel under my command and a budget of $22.5 million. I was an agent on the street for nine and a half years, and then I advanced administratively. I was a supervisor, and then I was uh, uh, numbers two man in Connecticut and Philadelphia and assistant special agent in charge was the title and then I became a chief inspector and then I was the agent in charge in Memphis Dallas and the senior special agent in charge in uh, Los Angeles because I had three other special agents in charge under me and 24 supervisors under them. I have uh, information chiseled in stone documented that the FBI had advanced knowledge about uh, 911 and did nothing to prevent this from occurring. And this is atrocious, it's unbelievable, have, having been a former FBI agent myself. And it's very obvious that this whole thing is being orchestrated by the powers that be at the highest level of our government. And I want the world to know about it. The minute I saw the planes fly in to the tower on television, live as a matter of fact, the f question I had in my mind was, there is no way, absolutely no way, that somebody could skyjack four planes, 20 people skyjack four planes, in this case 19 individuals, and our government would not know about it in, in advance. We have, the U.S. government, the most advanced intelligence techniques of anybody in the world. And there, it, you'll never convince me we didn't have advanced knowledge about what was going on. We saw the airplanes go in, and uh, it's also a question about whether they're remotely controlled. I don't know about that. I hate to comment on something that I, where I have no documentation, uh, but uh, there's much more to this story than has come out so far. Uh, you will never in a million years convince me that those, uh, those buildings, those towers uh, collapsed because those planes hit them. I'm, I'm confident that they were imploded. As a matter of fact, the, uh, there were seismograph uh, readings uh, from the, they think from the base of two of them about the time that the buildings uh, uh, collapsed. There were also molten steel that uh, was in the basement, uh, which is uh, a, a very high temperature uh, for uh, melt melting steel. And those planes hit above the 80th floor, so there's no way that that airplane fuel could have dropped down that low. Also, there were fires that burned in the basement for some 100 days afterwards. So there's some implication. There, there, there's some finagling. There's some maneuvering. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and there are many, many more people involved in this, than these, these so-called skyjackers and terrorists. The uh, anti-terrorism legislation uh, was written back in the middle 1980s under the George Bush Senior Administration. A female Department of Justice um, attorney, who was one of the authors, made the statement publicly, before this passes Congress, people have to be killed. Now, if we fast forward to a World Trade Center car bombing in February 1993. At that time, the FBI had a 43-year-old former Egyptian army officer as an informant who was in with the terrorists. He was commissioned by the terrorists to put the bomb together. 
He went to his FBI superiors, we're going to use a dummy bomb, right? And they said, no, we're going to use a real bomb. So the FBI not only knew in advance that they were going to bomb the World Trade Center, they furnished the ingredients for the bomb, which is absolutely unbelievable that they could get away with this. What's unbelievable about it is this was actually printed in the New York Times on October 28, 1993. But they got away with it. And if I was a congressman or senator, I would demand an investigation. Why would the FBI furnish the ingredients for the bomb that brought down or that, that had damaged the uh, World Trade Center in February 1993? We had six people killed there. We had uh, a thousand people injured. We had a total of six citizens um, who died in the February 1993 uh, World Trade Center car bombing. Uh, we had a thousand dollars worth of, a uh, thousand individuals were injured. We had uh, half a million dollars in damage. Uh, but there weren't enough people who died to pass the anti-terrorism legislation. So now we fast forward to uh, May the 19th, uh, April the 19th, 1995, World Trade, uh, excuse me, uh, Oklahoma City bombing. We had 168, 169 people who died, probably 169 because there was one leg they never did identify. And uh, a year later, the anti-terrorism legislation passed. Now, it wasn't tough enough. I can't prove that there were explosives that were placed in the World Trade Center in the 911 uh, situation. However, I, from what I've seen, uh, a, a, an expert uh, on implosions from Albuquerque, New Mexico, who worked for the government uh, as under government contract, stated immediately afterward that the buildings were imploded. And then he retracted his statement and said, well, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But basically, now he's saying that they weren't imploded. Uh, but uh, other experts who have looked at the, at the pictures uh, say that the buildings were imploded. I think that uh, in order to implode those buildings, there had to be uh, implications, government implications or involvement uh, in placing these charges. I mean, that was a tremendous uh, project. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many people would be involved in that. Going back to Oklahoma City, an inside investigator told me there were at least 11 other people involved in the Oklahoma City bombing. Now, if you have 11 other people involved in Oklahoma City, you're going to have three or four times that involved in the World Trade Center uh, situation. Okay, now we, we accidentally got the videos out of sequence, but that was Ted Gunderson. He's an FBI uh, analyst who... Uh, has been blowing the whistle about 9-11 being an inside job for a long time. We've had at least 10 different uh, uh, features about whistleblowers. People always say, well, you know, if 9-11 was an inside job, how are they keeping it secret and why hasn't anybody come forward? Well, dozens of people have come forward, dozens of them. In fact, in fact, probably uh, that many, probably about five of those have been you know, had suffered mysterious deaths after they came forward. But there are still at least 10 or more whistleblowers who have come forward and are still around to be, you know, questioned. So uh, it's just amazing the short-term memory that people have if they ever heard of these things at all. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and, and bring you this one clip that I was going to bring you about the uh, war on terror. And we'll be back again. And then I'll talk about directed energy weapons. There have been numerous times in this nation's history where certain civil liberties have been repealed. However, every time this has happened, it's been temporary in times of war or strife. And the rights have always been reinstated to the public. Take, for example, in 1861 when Lincoln temporarily suspended habeas corpus until the following year. What about under the Sedition Act of 1917, where anti-war speech against World War I was criminalized, only to be repealed three years later? Or many of you probably remember learning about Executive Order 9066, when FDR authorized the internment of Japanese-American citizens for four horrifying years. And lastly, during the Red Scare, McCarthy's witch hunt against Americans who were suspected to be communists lasted six years. And in all of these cases, as an unconstitutional they were, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. But fast forward to today. For the first time in American history, the rights of citizens have been systematically eroded under a blanket war against terror that has no clear goals, enemy, or end. So what does this mean for the restoration of our civil liberties today? 
To talk about just this, I was joined earlier by independent journalist Robbie Martin of MediaRoots.org. Check it out. So, Robbie, how is this war different than all these other periods in history that I just went over? Um, well, it's different in the fact that duration, which you went over quite well in your intro, but also it's different because all this was brought into fruition from 9-11, which is now over a decade old, and we haven't had any sort of ongoing threat or crisis that would um, legitimize these continuing civil liberty curtailments. Uh, so it's different in the sense that, you know, the things you mentioned, like the Civil War and World War II and the McCarthy era, I mean, each one of those actually had a cohesive, you know, you could argue about the reasoning for the for the civil liberties erosions that happened during those events, you know, that's a whole different argument. But they were all real things. The Civil War was a was a crisis, an American crisis. Um, World War II um, was an actual military, you know, operation. Um, we interned the Japanese because we thought that they were spies, which is absurd. But that's that was the reason. Um, so it's it's very different in the sense that this is almost turned into background noise, mm. um, where there's actually not anything happening or legitimizing these continuing erosions. Right, and they, and they keep happening, Robbie. I mean, and, and as you just said, there's nothing to legitimize them. I mean, the threat of terrorism is virtually non-existent in this country. You're more likely to die from accidental suffocation in bed than you are of a terrorist attack. And I wanted to play this clip from Glenn Greenwald on the Sam Cedars show talking about the Patriot Act. And now the Patriot Act is just something that never gets discussed anymore. It's not considered controversial. It's just blended in to our political um, culture. It's just something we now take for granted. And this to me shows how what is at one time a radical act um, and viewed as extremism um, ultimately becomes just normalized by lasting long enough and then just sort of blending into the woodwork. Let's, uh... I love what he says there because it's so true, Robbie. I mean, the Patriot Act was just one in a long list of systematic erosions of our civil liberties that, that isn't uh, talked about at all. It's just reinstated every time. There's absolutely no point of contention when at the time it was actually extremely controversial. So much uh, dissent against it. And now it's just voted in. I don't know. I mean, what do yeah. you think about it? Um, well, the Patriot Act is 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 one i would say one of three things that we that we did after 9-11 and you know supposedly in response to it um and the you know the the provisions in it which which basically make sneak and peek searches legal for any suspected terrorist or whatever um you know which essentially means the government could come into your house search your entire house your computer take all your data and never tell you and never have to bring it up in the court of law if they actually do prosecute you um i think that it's 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 really it's disturbing and unsettling how much it's gone into the background that the patriot act has already been in existence for 10 years it was signed again by obama um where he added on an extension to it. So, I mean, as far as I can see, uh, there's no chance that it will actually be repealed anytime soon. And it's already gone on for over 10 years. Right, right. So, and and let's, let's talk really quickly about what this is doing to people, especially, like you said, I mean, these sneak and peek searches, the Patriot Act's opening this, this massive surveillance grid, allowing for warrantless wiretapping. How does the surveillance grid and all of these new technologies play a role into the stifling of dissent, the chilling effect in this culture of fear in a post 9-11 world? Well, you know, if it wasn't irreversible enough by the duration and, and sort of the non-event that this was done in response to, um, it makes it even more irreversible because technology has become so advanced in the last decade um, you know, 9-11 happened around the same time that the internet was breaking through to the mainstream. So the internet, um, GPS tracking being affordable, you know, you can get a GPS tracker for 25, 40 bucks now. Um, and, you know, I mean, imagine what law enforcement and government have so much power now to spy on everybody and database communications from every everything. Um, that it makes it, it makes it more 
permanent. That's a I mean, really, really good point right there, is that it's almost impossible to go back. I mean, look at the, even the surveillance apparatus is now um, crossed over with the corporate, corporatocracy. I mean, the military industrial complex, all of these corporations and, and military corporations that are profiting off this technology, off of these erosions of our rights, the surveillance. Let's talk about habeas corpus, though, because I think a lot of instances in the past when habeas corpus was repealed temporarily, I mean, it was a huge deal temporarily was repealed and then reinstated now. I mean, we look back at the internment of Japanese citizens, it's almost embarrassing. It, it's, it is embarrassing. I mean, it's horrifying that we did that. And now, you know, you have the NDAA passed, reinstated, even after this lawsuit, massive protests. I mean, why is this accepted? Well, it's accepted for basically the what we're talking about now is the reason that it's accepted. Everybody's been conditioned to accept this sort of background noise of privacy, you know, elimination with the Patriot Act. Um, Gitmo has existed for over 10 years, so you can make, you draw a comparison to that, to the internment camps, and the internment camps were only around for four years. It took 35 years for the U.S. government to acknowledge the kind of the, um, you know, the violation that that was. Uh, Jimmy Carter paid out $200,000 to all the surviving people, uh, the Japanese who were interned. Um, it's already been 10 years of Gitmo. We're still accusing them of being dangerous terrorists, but yet where there's never been, you know, there's been very few trials of any of these people. Um, they're, they're indefinitely. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't see us looking back on this with the same level of embarrassment because it's become normalized. It's not like those other events in history where they were done in response to a, a major crisis that was ongoing. This you're, is not ongoing. You're when right. 9 11 happened on one single day. Right, Robbie. We've given the government a complete blank check in a post 9 11 world. It's absolutely unacceptable. Um, we need to demand our rights back before it's too late. Thank you so much for coming on, giving us your take. Robbie Martin of MediaRoots.org. Thanks for having me, Abby. How will we explain this world to our children? A world without privacy, one that's speaking out against the government, can get you thrown in jail indefinitely. One where dissent is now terrorism. And can, you can even be assassinated by this government. You know, we look back at McCarthyism and the Japanese internment as lessons to learn about past government transgressions. How long will it take back to look at this government's mistakes and this generation's mistakes? Because the longer we wait, the more we'll lose. Well, the videos just get better and better and better. And uh, I guess what I'm going to do is uh, introduce this next clip. And then we're going to uh, bring Marcella on and we'll open up the phone lines and we'll be talking about, you know, the Judy Wood directed energy. Uh, and I'm, I'm being very generous and I, when I call it a theory or a hypothesis. It's more like absolutely crazy. You know, the people who believe in this directed energy weapon stuff uh, consider themselves to be open-minded. Some of them even think that they know something about science. It turns out that it uh, doesn't take very much conversation to find out that they really don't. But I got something to say to you directed energy weapons people that think that having an open mind is such a good thing. Well, there's such a thing as having a mind that's so open that your brain falls out. So now we're going to go straight to this clip that's talking about directed energy weapons. Are you ready? I, here we go. and I'll hit the play button. Go ahead and put it on Taiwan. There you go, here we go.
there's two of these massive satellites orbiting Earth, or they had one in geostationary orbit over the equator firing a beam down at a steep angle over lower Manhattan. There's also the issue of timing and precision. Look at any video of the buildings collapsing and ask yourself what would be required to reproduce these events exactly as they happened. Several thousand major structural components would need to be severed in exactly the right manner within fractions of a second of one another. Even if the Hutchison effect was a proven technology, which I don't deny and it still could turn out to be, then how is it deployed with such precision and timing? Why did people report explosions? I've heard Judy Wood try to explain away all the multiple reports of explosions with her Hutchinson effect hypothesis, using the example of an egg in a microwave exploding without the use of explosives. But if the Hutchinson effect was active before the first plane even hit, then how can it also explain the precision with which the towers came down? All of this seems to me as a way to overcomplicate what really happened on 9-11 and distract and confuse anyone trying to unravel the mystery. Judy Wood has attacked all the evidence pointing to nanothermite and attempted to explain it all away in terms of some exotic effect which has never been experimentally reproduced or scientifically verified. Many of the pictures used in her book and on her website indicate irregular heating, burning, and warping of various materials, which she then posits could only have been produced by an exotic and unproven mechanism. I would suggest that many of these characteristics are consistent with pyroclastic flow damage seen in volcanic eruptions and could have just as easily been produced by superheated exploded steel and concrete using nanothermite. Take this picture for instance. The car is only burned on the top half. If you think about a cloud of superheated gas expanding and rolling outwards from the collapsing buildings, the gas inside the middle of the pyroclastic flow will be the hottest, but will cool down considerably on the surface of the cloud, where it is expanding and coming into contact with surrounding cooler air. As the cloud rolls outward over cars like this one, the superheated gas at the center will be hot enough to melt the paint, while the cooler periphery of the cloud as it rolls across the ground will leave the lower half of the car at a much lower temperature than the superheated gas near the middle of the cloud. So you see there are alternative explanations for all of the material characteristics of debris seen in Dr. Wood's extensive photo collections, which thankfully don't involve wacky analogies to food and kitchen items. In one instance, Dr. Wood compares the molten metal dripping from the south tower shortly before it collapses to the orange color of Cheetos snack food. I don't know about you, but to me it looks an awful lot like thermite. Of course, that doesn't mean it is thermite, just that there isn't any other convincing alternative explanation which is backed by a verifiable experiment. I'm sure we could continue this debate for hours. In the meantime, feel free to take a look at drjudywood.com as well as the 9-11 section of alienscientist.com under the Conspiracy tab. And if you'd like to discuss this topic at length, visit alienscientist.com slash forum, where unlike YouTube comments, you can actually have a detailed discussion and the ability to post links, pictures, and videos. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. I've heard some people tell me they think Judy Wood is a disinfo agent, injecting the movement with bogus theories in an attempt to undermine and ridicule the more serious scientific groups like AE911 Truth. I've also heard that she is part of a PSYOP, trying to discredit the nanothermite evidence and engage people in an endless debate over what happened on 9-11 in order to prevent them from looking at who was behind it. People have drawn attention to the fact that she hasn't yet lost her university position like other scientists and researchers who have spoken out openly about 9-11. I've heard a lot of different things. So let's get this debate going. Alienscientist.com slash forum. Thanks for watching. Okay, um, I, I really like Alien Scientist. He's a, a genuine scientist as far as I can tell. At least he certainly talks like one. And if you've ever listened to Judy Wood, she sounds the least like any scientist that I've ever met. Anyway, as you see, Marcella has joined us, and uh, maybe what we should do is take care of business and let you make the announcements before we run out of time. But, but we're going to open up the phone lines, as you see the numbers up there. Uh, so anyway. Yeah, I just wanted to make two an, um, an announcement about the, the next. Um, I, we're, we're both with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. I helped co-found co the Portland chapter, and as a Portland chapter, we try and offer free library presentations of the latest DVD by Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which is entitled, 9-11 Explosive Evidence uh, Experts Speak Out, and 
This year we're going to try and have be, cons be consistent about having two free library presentations every month throughout this year. And in February we have free library presentations in uh, on this on February sixth at the Belmont Library and February twelfth at the Central Library. At the end of the free at the end of the showing of the DVD, which is an hour and 30 minutes. We do hand out free DVDs during the Q&A, or actually after the Q&A. So please come out, um, come out and, see, and see one of the free library presentations of 9-11 Explosive Evidence Ex Experts Speak Out. Again, it is a 90-minute documentary, and um, we're going to be trying to have it around different areas of Portland and maybe even outside of Portland, but for right now, the Portland metro area. And um, yeah. And please go to our website, architects, uh, uh, portlandae911truth.org is our website. And it's, I just realized it's not on the, dune, shoot, it's not on the, on the, well, on what you're seeing, but anyway, it is. They'll get it up a little bit later, but. Um, yeah, so please join us for a free library presentation of the movie 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. And at the end of the, of the, during the Q&A, we will be giving out free DVDs. Yeah, so please show up. And, um, and and consider volunteering with us. That's right, and not only that, but uh, you can come down and watch our show live uh, the first and third Saturdays. You come down between four and five, and uh, the show starts live at five. You can watch from inside the control room if we don't have a big crowd, but uh, you might just get inspired to uh, get yourself trained up and become a, a volunteer producer and help people put out this alternative news that's blowing away the uh, mainstream news <clears throat> yeah um, yeah by the way it, you were pretty successful with the uh, presentations and DVD giveaways in January at what the 23rd is that what it was um, yeah um, on we our first library presentation this year was in January and it was at the Hillsdale library the Hillsdale library was actually our very first library presentation ever uh, a couple years ago but um, yeah yeah I don't uh, know if you were aware but I you know I've been tuning into cable access channels at weird hours and I keep running into rebroadcasts of the full, you know, almost two hour uh, experts speak out that I've submitted here. They use it as filler here. They're really, uh, you know, kind of with us on trying to get out some important news. They're not, they're not biased in any way, but they uh, appreciate the fact that I submit programs that people really like to watch they, they call up all the time and say would you please replay that and then they get mad you're working for the you're working for the government you won't replay it you know they have schedules to worry about don't you know i don't think you have to worry about that here yeah so so, so you can possibly catch the movie on on the on free cable here here or by going to our one of the free library presentations that we that we provide so now getting back to what we just showed the the judy woods uh hypothesis of directed energy weapons somehow blowing away the buildings um, could you put my uh, Taiwan behind us and what I've got is my uh, YouTube channel if you go to YouTube and you can watch this with with me right now go to YouTube and 251 Omega uh, what I if you look at the comments section you'll or the uh, what do they call it uh, the feed I guess you click on feed instead of uploads and you'll see comments anytime I make a comment on anybody else's video anywhere on YouTube there's a copy of it that gets put onto my website and if you're browsing my website you can just see the type of remarks I make on other sites and uh, you know a lot of times you go back and reread them and they don't uh, sit too well but I've been pretty lucky that way I don't know if you can read what we've got behind me but uh, basically uh, the I, I posted the expert speak out video on my YouTube channel and a Judy Wood uh, proponent watched it and they made some sort of, you know, Judy Wood has let the cat out of the bag now remark and, you know, so I had to remark, as you see right here on the top of the page it said, uh, my, my comment was, if Judy Wood is a scientist, she hides it very well. She also avoids answering questions in a verifiable form. To be consistent with the facts, you'd have to say Dr. Judy Woods has misidentified the technology. The original quote was Dr. Judy Woods has identified the technology, the cat's out of the bag. Well, nonsense. I said, since she won't reveal the science that she relied on to reach her directed energy weapons theory, here's a complete scientific analysis. And then I referred her to um, the 911blogger.com 
uh, page where they have a, a brief analysis of Dr. Judy Wood's request for correction to NIST, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it, it's a real good analysis, including an analysis of how much energy it would take to achieve what she claims happened. Well, this, there's a, a fellow who goes by September 11 Discovery, and he immediately fired back, it's amazing how a person like you can write so many words without making one single point of fact. I guess he missed the, my reference to the brief analysis of Dr. Judy Wood's request. I guess that doesn't count as a single fact. But anyway, he says, please provide just one thing Judy Woods claims that she don't back up with a ton of evidence. And then he says, well, we won't hear from you again. He goes on, and please don't provide links to Greg, Greg Jenkins bullshit. In her own words, just one thing Judy Woods claims that's wrong. Well, first of all, it, it's a dead giveaway when he says, something is wrong with Greg Jenkins. He's a physics professor who bent over backwards in an interview with du Judy Woods to to get her to describe her hypothesis and you know anything that would help us understand it and she just wouldn't. <coughs> anyway, um, I've got to get a drink of water. Okay, okay. You continue. I'll come back and I'll read my answer to that in just a minute. Um, well, I I want to provide one distinction between uh, Judy Woods, because he, he's talking about Judy, Dr. Judy Woods, who um, was actually here in Portland, uh, I believe it was last year, she was um, one of the 9-11, the Portland 9-11 Truth Alliance brought her in to give a presentation. And one of the things that, that, that distinguishes her directed energy, you know, like she's talking about directed energy weapons were used to bring down the towers. And as representatives of, of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, um, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth tries to educate you that the three, there were three towers that went down in New York City. And the three, the, sorry, the three towers were brought down using explosives. And that's what, and that's what architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth tries to educate you on. So that's like the big dis distinction between Judy Woods and an organization like Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And I believe we have a caller, so if the caller wants to say something. Okay, well, while we're waiting, um, here's the answer that I gave him. I, because he asked for just one thing that Judy Woods claims that wasn't true. And uh, my answer was, well, she claims the existence of directed energy weapons with sufficient power and the ability to destroy the World Trade Center buildings. The energy required to produce the observed destruction is more than the entire capacity of all the world's electric power plants combined. Unless Judy Wood can explain how to power such a weapon and can provide an explanation of the principles of applied physics that give this weapon its extraordinary abilities, her DEW hypothesis is unsupported and demonstrably false. You got a little tongue tied up, demonstrably false. So, we do have a color. After that, the guy comes back one more time, and this is, this is what I, I really had to show you. Uh, he comes Hello, back. Hello, just a second. He says, laughing oh, out loud. He says, first, the towers are not there anymore. And the evidence clearly points to they mostly turn to dust. So obviously there's more than enough power. Is that a circular argument or what? You know, he says, they were brought down with this powerful weapon. And then I, I said, but wait a minute. How do we know there's enough power? I mean, how do we know there's, how did you power it? He says, well, we don't have to worry about that. The fact that they were destroyed proves that there was enough power. <laughs> God. So that's just crazy nonsense. I mean, it shows the reasoning ability. So here's my answer to that. And I, I realized you just couldn't go on. There's no way that science made any impression on people like that. So I said, you and Judy Wood seem to share the same level of logic and scientific reasoning. That fact seriously limits the chances of any meaningful communication and precludes the possibility of a scientific examination of this issue. What we have here is a failure to communicate. Have a nice day. And I don't intend to respond to that fellow anymore. I, I uh, quoted that uh, Strother Martin from uh, uh, Cool Hand Luke there. Um, caller, if you'd like to say, if you'd like yeah, to speak up. Sorry, caller. Go ahead. Hi, um, I, I don't disagree necessarily that 9-11 was an inside job. 
Um, my, here's my piece. It's, it's uh, you're breaking up. Try, you're breaking up. Say that again. Uh, uh, who cares if 9/11 was an inside job? I mean, in, I mean, of course, it's horrible that all these people died. Of course, uh, but um, you know, George Bush mass murdered 600,000 Iraqis. Like, why this crime? Like, why not Fallujah? Why? I mean, why not? Um, you know, of the millions of people the United States has, has killed. Why is it that you focus solely on the American casualties, and you know why not stick with the atrocities that happened in the Philippines or in Vietnam? Or just, like, what's so special about nine eleven? That's a very good question, and I have a good answer. Nine um, eleven was actually uh, a coup d'état, where a faction of our government forcibly took over the power of our country uh, in order to run illegal wars and tighten up a police state and you're seeing the direct results of that with the you know tightening up on guns but every single loss of our freedoms that we've encountered since then the Patriot Act the NDAA with indefinite detention the president being able to assassinate anybody just on his own say so all those things are based on 9-11 being some sort of a terrorist attack from outside our country it wait, turns wait, wait, wait. out are, are you saying it'd be okay if it wasn't i mean if it actually was 19 arabs who did this didn't that stuff would be okay like well, it doesn't matter who did it that wouldn't be okay anyway like even if it was not an inside job it would still not be okay to take away people's freedoms and and also, if I can add one more thing, is the United States has always been a, a, a horrible government. You know, it's always been an oppressive, awful place. And since, I mean, the founders were slave owners. They're basically Nazis, right? They're a bunch of white supremacist genocidal maniacs. But nothing is nothing has changed really. This is the way the United States has, has always been, right? So, I is mean, that, so you're just saying that now in segregation? Let's what's leave the, it that way because that's the way it's always and been. When they had Chinese workers getting blown up, I mean. Okay, well, the point, the point is that, you know, if you show that they lied about 9-11 and, and that the actual people that are, some of them are still in power right now, especially the people who are continuing to cover up are still part of that criminal group, um, the point is that everything we're doing, occupying the Middle East, uh, running drone strikes against everybody, tightening up on all of our rights and all that is based on the lie of 9-11 that we have to do something because we're threatened it turns out well wait a minute it turns out that we were not threatened from outside our country that was completely from within our country now the only uh, the only uh purpose of the arabs was just something for us to point our fingers at and start blaming muslims now that's an old trick to divide and conquer using religion using race Whatever it takes to get us arguing amongst oh, ourselves. Even if, even if it was as the Muslims as these nineteen people, it still wouldn't be okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, oh no, you're. I agree it, with it that. Matter, it doesn't matter who did nine eleven. Everything that is being done, even if even if even if it wasn't an inside job, is still it's still so like. I just, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. That we're still being criminal, no matter what our reasoning is. Uh, and and on that, from that point of view, you're absolutely right. We should stop it no matter what. But so many people are, are you know, they turn around and they, they absolutely jump on you with hostility like you're some enemy of the state because you don't understand that we were attacked by Muslims. Oh, we've got to war against those Muslims. And it builds up this hatred that that destroys us it that hatred destroys our peace it destroys the truth and it allows the power structure to keep soaking us for money based on a lie we don't need to have a military all over the world because there really isn't any danger other than what we create so since we create it we need to stop it and the people that think that 9-11 justified it need to know that 9-11 was a lie that's why it's important there isn't any other single thing you can point at that would that would blanket all the things we're doing like 9-11 does. Sure. But, we, don't, you, but don't you kind of legitimize we, the, the racism? Like, don't you kind of legitimize it by saying, when you say 9-11 was an inside job, you kind of imply that if it wasn't, 
then everything would be okay. Like, why not just oh, be no, anti-imperialist, you know? Why no. not just be anti-capitalist? Why not just be, uh, you know, opposed to aggression and say, just because 19 dudes did something, uh, it doesn't matter no, anyway. I just, like, I just got why, done telling why, you. why debate 9-11 hey, if it doesn't even matter in the, in the first place? I just got done telling you that I agree that, you know, there is no justification whatsoever. But the people that bring up that justification... Um, are the ones that that are that we need to address because they they seem to keep it as long as they can use that as a cover story they get to kind of brush away anybody's complaint saying that that you know supersedes whatever you have to say about it because terrorism we have to be safe from and sometimes you have to tighten your belt blah 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 all that's just a bunch of lies we have another caller okay well anyway got to let you go caller we got another call 2 minutes to go callers Go ahead, caller. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. You got two minutes. Okay. Um, I was calling because when 9-11 originally happened, I believed that it was caused by the government, which is why our president was in Texas and not in the White House. <laughs> and I also believe that our current president that we have um, in his situation doesn't want to be president he wants to be king and he wants <laughs> to take all of our rights away from us and he's doing it one at a time that's absolutely correct and that's why it's so important not to bow down on this second amendment thing you know if i had any money i'd go out and buy guns myself i i'm not a weapon man but i'm broke that's probably the best way they can keep me from getting a gun <laughs> they don't have to pass a law <laughs> Well, I think the Americans is run like a herd of cattle. They follow the lead cow, and everybody's going to go off the cliff. And <laughs> That's I lemmings. Won't follow you're the mixing lead metaphors, cow. but I understand what you're saying. Okay, well, we got one minute left, and uh, I want to remind people that you can see all these shows if you go to YouTube, and 251 Omega is the channel. And feel free to write me uh, with the email, uh, which you'll see up there. Eventually, um, two five one omega at comcast dot net. If you'd like to make a comment, and of course you can always make a comment. Hey, you got forty and, seconds. And, and also, uh, uh, please feel free to go to Portland AE nine eleven truth dot org for any upcoming free library presentations. Last year, we had the founder of Architects and Engineers for nine eleven truth. His name is Richard Gage. We had him here twice last year. <laughs> We're going to have him here again this year. And I um, mean, you know, just go to our website Portland AE nine eleven truth for any upcoming library presentations or any presentations in general. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you in two weeks. Okay, we're going to roll the credits. Credits should be already rolling. All right. Have a good one. Credits. Roll credits. Anytime. <laughs> we're, we're basically off the air, but we'll let the credits roll for the YouTube people. If they come up.